When I first watched Fully Cooly on a too warm Sunday afternoon on my grandparents' Dell computer, something stirred within me, maybe for the first time. I was just watching AMVs and stumbled across one for an anime I'd never heard of and was completely enraptured, immediately rushing to watch the whole of this FLCL show, each episode in three parts in one sitting. I remember the ache in my chest as my mom drove me home shortly after credits rolled on episode 6, something so unlike anything I'd seen, so brazen and alien to me in its sensibilities had practically crash landed into my life and in just two short hours it was gone again. My hippocampus was nowhere near developed enough to retain more than the rough outline by the time we'd reached home, but the rough outline was all I needed to know, even without the conscious thought, maybe, that anime would be a part of my life forever. This is, of course, not a unique experience. In fact, it's a massive cliche, much more so if you also swap 2008 with 2003 and YouTube in three parts with Adult Swim at Midnight, or whatever year and programming block it may have aired on in your country, you get me. Among a particular generation of weeaboos, having first seen the series at more or less the same age as Nauta and Inamori, and quote, not understanding a thing, but loving it all the same, at times feels like a prerequisite to talking about Fully Cooly on the internet at all. So the adage goes, if it didn't hit you right then and there, why wouldn't you be talking about something else with that much fervor, right? You probably had Ava or Akira hit you where Fully Cooly hit me, which don't worry, objectively makes you cooler. But the point remains that I have spent more than half my life trying and failing to attest to what this show has meant to me, the ways it's shaped me, and how my relationship to it has changed over time, so I'm not really sure what about my most recent watch acutely struck the back of my head like an ice pick and forced the compulsion to try once again in such a definitive fashion as an internet video I can't make any alterations to once it's live, but hopefully I'll have figured it out by the end, and I don't know, maybe it's okay if I don't get it right this time either. Uh, but first, really quickly, touched or been touched by cassettes are back. I'm so sorry they sold out as fast as they did last time. I know a lot of people who wanted them weren't able to get them, but I'm happy to keep making them for as long as there are people who want them, so don't worry too much about missing your chance this time either. And they're the exact same as last time, so if you already got one, you don't need to buy a second one. Uh, link in the pinned comments. Okay, let's rock. What I need to keep in mind when attempting to say anything of substance about Fooly Cooly is that when the anime hit for me, a time when I had neither consistent access to the internet nor any premium cable packages, it was like two and a half of the maybe 11 hours of anime I watched in a year, so of course I was going to be as hyper attentive as my still untuned eyes would allow, and it was going to remain in my thoughts for longer. This was no less true of shows that had far less of an impact on me. You better believe I still know most of the words to the fucking Fighting Food on theme song. Naturally, in that process, one's brain is going to start to see more than is really there, which like making those sorts of connections beyond what the creators possibly could have intended is half the fun of developing such a long-standing relationship to a piece of art, multiplicity of meaning, baby. But it is not the 2000s anymore, thank god, and I watched 377 hours of anime in the last year alone, and I kind of just want to lay down when I'm exposed to works that are dense in similar ways as Fully Cooly felt to me as a teen, no matter the artistry on display, unless they are really fondling me where it counts. It's difficult to approach this series with unfamiliar eyes when so many of its rhythms are fundamental to how my brain thinks about anime. Yet, at the same time, I don't really want to play into the whole, oh, you have to see it more than once to really get it narrative, in part because I think if you felt compelled to seek it out a second time, you probably really got it where it counted, and those subsequent viewings, where those blurry spots became a little sharper, were more about bridging a gap between a gut feeling and an understanding of what elicited that feeling in you, 
than they were for understanding these series as a linear sequence of events. And on the flip side, it's fine if it didn't hook you, or if you didn't like it for any number of other reasons. If you don't feel compelled by it, there's no reason to force it. There's a lot of other art out there for you, maybe even by the minds of the same people. You ever see the Japan Animator Expo short that Tsurumaki directed? It's great. And, I don't know, maybe it's not as deep as some of us insist in the first place. Like, the phallic imagery seems like it's in service to these immaculately constructed puberty metaphors when you're 13 and you only realized it after you finished the series, but I don't know, I kind of think they might just be dick jokes. Especially going from Evangelion with all its, and I say this lovingly, overwrought psychosexual imagery that ultimately boiled down to, yeah, there was a psychology boom in the 90s and the boys were not immune. Fully Cooley's boner sight gags, so blunt they nearly defy meaning, are refreshing. Through all the noise and chaos, the show's got a simple heart, and that's what allowed it to connect so easily to the people it did, even when they weren't so caught up in thinking about whether or not Conti was a stand-in for Naucho's brother, or Haruko's bird boyfriend or whatever, and like, I say that as someone who thought it was so cool when it finally clicked for me, on like my second or third viewing, hey wait, I think Mamimi might not just be talking about a game. I'm not gonna sit here and act like the series taught me story comprehension or whatever, but I don't think any of what I'd consumed at that point had presented me with an unreliable narrator before. Look, like everyone was stupid back then, it was a different time. We were all too busy lining our entire lower lids to be concerned with things like media literacy. Well, no, it was good. The more I think about the things I like and dislike, the more the reasons don't really come together. There are things I like in Fully Kool Aid that I don't like in other art, and there are things I like in other art that I don't like in Fully Kool Aid. I like things that are frustratingly naturalistic, and I like things that are big and loud and obnoxious, and sometimes I don't like those things for having either of those qualities. I've kind of come to feel that trying to distill your taste into something quantifiable can be a little dicey. You give the wrong answer because you need to say something to try to work out how you feel aloud, and it runs the risk of getting solidified because what you said is all that's been externalized about your endlessly complex relationship to art. So that's all anyone else in the conversation has to go off, and moreover can then become a framework you attempt to apply across more and more axes regarding your own taste. Bear in mind the irony of what I'm about to say in contrast, but I think this is why the closest thing to a through line that exists in the art I love most is that they hit my heart well before they hit my brain. Or they hit my heart much harder than they did my brain. Maybe even more than my brain wanted. In a similar fashion as we loftily talk about the concept of the human soul, I sometimes find an evanescent quality within a work of art that resists to be quantified, and I usually try to listen. There's a kind of limitless warmth and joy to be found in allowing myself to not fully understand these things. I know, I picked a great career path. However, it is a career path that, in tandem with my already bizarre proclivities, led me to the kind of revelation about Fooly Cooly that I figured I'd long since finished having, and I don't know, maybe it's been obvious to you since like 2003. I was 16 when I realized that Firestarter shit. So here's a question, did Japanese fans even like Fooly Cooly? That's not rhetorical, I'm still not entirely sure, and I spent days trying to get to the bottom of it. It was a hunch I'd had for a while, probably since the later seasons, I haven't seen them, not interested, were announced as co-productions with Adult Swim, or maybe when I realized just how little merch there was for the series, especially compared to most any other Gainax property. I won't harp on this point because it's hardly definitive evidence, but it took until 2018 for a figure of Mami Me to be released. It's the fucking Funko Pop! Not counting the Takara fashion doll, of course, it's kind of its own category in my mind, and ditto goes for garage kits, most of which are made by fans. It also took until the same year for the series to find its way into being represented in the Super Robot Wars games, and it's one of the mobile ones. But again, that's kind of small stuff. What really fueled this confusion for me was reading a 2011 interview with translator Michael House. I would like to hear about Fooly Cooly. I've never been sure whether it was actually really good or Ava-style superficiality turned up to the maximum. 
if it was good, you could prove it to me or the local Japanese audience, which rebelled promptly with the first episode sparking increasingly snide digs at said audience by Tsuramaki in later episodes. And that's all I'm going to say about that. The interviewer notes that they'd never heard of such a backlash before, and like, it's not unheard of for the English-speaking anime fanbase to just wholly miss a domestic controversy, especially one that was at the time of the interview, but a decade on. But I couldn't even recall anything in Fully Cooly that could be interpreted as digs at its audience. I tried looking through the later parts of the series with this in mind, but didn't really see anything that could be interpreted that way, aside from maybe Kitsurabami saying the hand grabbing the iron is too obvious, which is kind of more self-deprecating than anything. As a whole, the interview with House comes off as rather dismissive and pessimistic toward Gainax, which, given it sounds like the guy wasn't treated especially well by the company, hey, I get it. But you kind of have to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt as a result. Still though, I decided to check some Nii Channel threads about Fully Cooly from around the time of its release, because I figured if inflammatory criticism of a Gainax show was going to happen anywhere, it'd be there. Turns out, it's kinda just lukewarm. Aside from someone jokingly accusing the series of being made for tax purposes, and an exhaustive argument about the definition of moe that breaks out partway through, because of course, the conversation is largely made up of befuddlement about things like why are there so many parodies and references, but especially about the character motivations and backstories. Nobody could figure out what Adamisk actually was, or whether or not Haruko is actually an alien. Frankly, as otaku are oft wont to do, they kinda miss the forest for the trees. Almost overloaded by context, only able to see it within the confines of the changing paradigms in anime. I'm not kidding, they really couldn't shut the fuck up about whether or not it was sufficiently moe, whether it was for otaku or not or as an extension of Gainax's legacy, who were, if I understand right, already kind of looked at as past their prime by these types, perceived as unlikely to shake the culture like they did through the 80s and 90s. Side note, lol, like none of them were willing or able to just shut up and Robert Brisson voice, feel it, feel whether or not they even liked it. But I get that. I think everyone really invested in something niche gets like this sometimes. Like, saying nothing of my feelings on them, perhaps some of you experienced similar baggage overload with, say, the rebuild of Evangelion Project, or Twin Peaks The Return, or uh, the At the Drive-In Reunion, uh, Zulowski's Cosmos? I don't know, Vlad Love? But none of this looks like rebellion to me. Not the kind of rebellion we've seen sink ships. So I guess the validity of House's claims are still in limbo from where I'm standing. No matter which way the coin lands though, my point stands. Fully Cooly wasn't remotely the phenomenon domestically that it would go on to be overseas. I'm not really sure what the general consensus is on why Fully Cooly resonated so hard with Western audiences, but it's probably something along the lines of Oh, it's like Cowboy Bebop, it's got Western sensibilities, whatever that means. And for American viewers, it had the benefit of airing on Adult Swim, but I'm not so sure that that's a complete answer. Fully Cooly was certainly influenced by plenty of Western media, which I'll get to, and some may shock you, but those elements feel more like buoys in a vast and torrential ocean than anything necessarily grounding. Part of what makes Fully Cooly such a disorienting first watch as a burgeoning young weeaboo and general weeb curious late night TV watcher is that it's like stepping into a conversation that's been going on for five hours and expecting to pick up on what these people were talking about and where the conversation started based on context within the conversation itself. This is a show whose first line is a misquoted Ashita no Jo reference. The dub, which let's be real with ourselves, most people my age saw first, it's a meme type of thing. Leaves in all sorts of Japanese turns of phrase and onomatopoeia. And if you saw that shit on broadcast or on YouTube, you didn't have the translation notes. And even when the dialogue isn't utterly non sequitur, it's just fucking weird and totally breakneck. 
I need to make it clear that despite what I was talking about at the start of this video, like, I do not think this is an easily digestible series. I'm not trying to, oh, Kingdom Hearts is not that complicated, you. But I think we benefited from how fucking confusing it was. I don't really see Fooly Cooly as a coming of age story. I think it captures the indeterminate twilight hour before you start actually coming of age, where you're made aware of how much bigger the world is than you, but your brain is literally just not developed enough to comprehend it all yet. I don't know that there's an off the nose way to articulate how that applies here, but I'm sure you're following where I'm taking you. Nauta is thrust into the world of adults and it's so fucking hectic and chaotic and he's being tasked with the impossible and within just a few episodes the stakes are cosmically vast beyond comprehension and even his deadbeat older brother's attachment issues GF and her emotional problems are more than he should have to handle. I think this is part of why Nina Mori's episode was always the one I felt I understood the clearest even from watch one because she's the only one who's remotely Nauta's age. Her Problems are the only ones on his level, so they're told with minimal abstractions. I am, generally speaking, at best unamused by, and at worst, feel like I'm watching a dog hump its owner's leg when confronted with, the ways in which Gainax's oeuvre feels psychosexually trapped at age 14. But therein exist these occasional moments of clarity toward that fact, and Fooly Cooly feels perhaps the most tonally cohesive in that regard. Much like Evangelion, Fooly Cooly is very much so a work about a generation of adults failing the up-and-coming generation, and predetermining said generation to a cynicism toward the future and a resistance to growing up, right? When the anime insists that retaining some juvenility and not denying it as a part of you is court leading a fulfilling adulthood, it's with a kind of awareness that childhood honestly sucks fucking ass and is very stifling. I think Pillow's frontman Yamanaka Sawa put it best when talking about the series for the booklet included in the Ultimate Edition DVD set. Have you ever thought, I want to go back to those good old days? I've never thought that, not even once. I really love the now of life. Even on my worst days, I always feel like, well, tomorrow will definitely be better. I love the me who grew up. The truth is, adulthood is freedom. Childhood is not freedom. Childhood was boring. When I was about Nauta's age, I couldn't accept the position I was in, being a kid and all. I was always irritated. It's an interesting and certainly more optimistic contrast against one of Gainax's other favorite themes, that of devotion to something that will take everything from you and leave you with next to nothing in return. No maturation but the stiffening of your joints and the brittling of your bones. Fully Cooly sort of posits a capacity to even just laugh at poop jokes as kind of revolutionary, like, fuck yeah, you can still be a responsible, functional adult and still be a free spirit. And I think that's another key part of what makes Fully Cooly enduring for me, and why I don't really believe it had to hit you when you were around Nauta's age. To bond with it to the degree that I and a lot of other people have, sure, but certainly not to get anything out of it. I mean, fuck. We're living in the sum totality of culture at the brink of bursting at the seams, and we're just supposed to make sense of it enough to navigate daily life? I'm in my mid to late 20s, and I feel ancient when I hear people just a few handful of years younger than me talk to each other. I'm already losing people close to me, but I feel like I'm just waking up. And I know saying this is going to make people even just a few years older than me feel either ancient or like I'm just some brat who thinks she has more life experience than she does, which, hey, so be it. I get it. But it's not like there's nothing I can do about this feeling. I'm doing my best to work toward being a more complete person, even in ways as trivial as learning more about the things I love. My dear friend Coffee Cakes recently described Fully Cooly as a work that can really grow with you, and I think that's a great way to put it. He's also smart and nice, and he made a video about this show too that you should watch along with all of his other videos. Both as a byproduct of increased access to information as the internet not only grew more widespread, but became home to better and better resources for understanding anime as a medium and a culture, and simply living more life, each rewatch with Fully Cooly has filled in a few more gaps 
apps for me. I didn't know what Lupin the Third was when I was 12, but I did when I was 16. I didn't know who Ohira Shinya was when I was 19, but at 26 I clocked this scene in episode 2 as his almost immediately. And you know what else changed since my last watch of Fooly Cooly? This channel. <laughs> yeah, I'm much deeper in this shit now, and the task of learning about this little anime's development finally feels exciting. Which is why, in addition to looking through a hefty handful of other resources on this series, I imported this little book, Fully Kulik Noise, a transcription of a conversation between original planner and director Tsurumaki Kazuya and character designer Sadamoto Yoshiyuki. And like, I don't know, I think there's a certain amount of risk in speaking too directly about your creations. You can find people as far back as 1996 talking about how Anno spoiled Eva's magic by over-talking it. And while I don't feel that way, I get it with other creators. I know I basically have a fucking Oshi frenzy meter where the longer I go without watching something of his, the closer I get to thinking I just outright hate the guy because he's got such a propensity for saying the dumbest shit possible about his work. Work. And then I watch something of his, and every time, without fail, it gets reset. Like, have you seen Talking Head? That movie's fucking crazy. It's great. I love it. Someone really needs to pick up the rights for Tachiguishi Ratsuden for release in English language territories. I gotta know what's going on there. But yeah, this kind of thing is a gamble, and mind you, in the grand scheme, I've really not read that much from the guy, but Tsurumaki is perhaps the Gainax alum I enjoy reading from the most. I don't know, I just think because when he talks about these shows, it's not in dialogue with anything but the work itself, and more importantly, the work that went into it. Fully Coolic Noise really lays bare that the anime was a product of iteration, rather than something that exited his mind fully formed. Layer by layer, brick by brick, Tsurumaki added to the series its world and characters, and then it was further iterated on once it was in the hands of the rest of the staff, even all the way down to the dubbing process. It's like the Winchester Mystery House. This is something I always assumed was the case about Fooly Cooly, because stories like this often have a very honest feeling to them, because you can start to see the creators fleshing out smaller ideas, then working to bring everything together, even as their elements naturally grow more and more disparate. Even a mixed success under these circumstances will have a few things for any given viewer to connect to. All right, you ready to get tits deep in the weeds? On Twitter, I said I'd be making a full thread of stuff from the book after this video goes live, but I decided to just include it all in here anyway because the rest of this video already wound up much longer than I was planning. Haha, <laughs> whoops, oops. I'm just gonna blitz through the shit in this book that I thought was interesting but couldn't really get to elsewhere in the video more naturally before I get back to talking about my feelings or whatever this video is about. Just keep in mind that I am not a translator, so I'm not gonna be quoting anything directly and I'm not including any Thing that I can't be 100% sure I understand without a lot of caveats. Mm -mm. So Amaral is supposed to be fucking Brazilian? Just like Luffy? Hell yes. Amazing. Rather than seaweed, he should have had gigantic fucked up slices of pizza for eyebrows. Yeah. I'm unsure if this also means that Kitsurabami is, I don't know if they're supposed to be from the same department of the bureau or not, but Brazilian Fully Coolie fans, I think you should claim her until further notice. A bit more about Amaral, he was inspired by Dale Cooper, not really too surprising. Cooper's tape recorder was an asset that made him sort of strange and perhaps unknowable. Well, those seaweed eyebrows are Amaral's Diane. This is a little obvious, I think, but both his eyebrows and the cockroach in episode 4 used textures taken from photos. Although in the latter case, Ogura Nobutoshi originally wanted the cockroach to be a 3D model. I guess just on the subject of mixed media stuff, the source of the medical mechanica hand changes from episode to episode. In episode 5 it's Takamura Kazuhiro's, and in 6 it's Tsurumaki's. The face that shows up in the cartoon dust cloud in episode 3 is also Takamura Kazuhiro, and he was put there because his face also shows up in Kare Kano episode 19. Let's talk about locations. The cafe Naota drags Mamimi to in episode 5 was originally supposed to be a love hotel, which kind of explains its look. Tsurumaki describes Mabase as an amalgam of Niigata, Toyohashi, and Saitama, and similarly, the ending sequences shot by Masayuki were done all over. 
They proved to be kind of grueling by the sound of it. Masayuki was out for so long he managed to get sunburnt despite it being shot in February. Poor guy. And to add insult to injury, he got scolded on multiple occasions by old men for filming and for being an obstruction. He said that when he got back to the Gainax offices after shooting one day, everybody thought that he was drunk because his cheeks were so red from the sunburn. And speaking of the ending sequence, on the subject of the show's music, Tsurumaki notes he never understood the stigma in the anime industry against using vocal tracks as BGM. Sure, voices overlap, and that's generally seen as taboo in anime, but live-action dramas use them all the time. Luckily, Gainax had a strong relationship with King Records at the time, which meant negotiations and licensing were probably pretty easy, although that's my speculation. It's never brought up anywhere I saw. Something else Fully Coolic Noise never brings up that I wish it had was the fact that, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, a few years before Fully Coolie's release, Anno Hideaki's live-action film Love and Pop used the Pillows track Like a Love Song back to back. And I was hoping to hear if Tsurumaki got the idea from Anno, or if it was the other way around, or if the duo were introduced to the band's music by an outside source, or if it was the idea of someone at King Records. Zero clue. That information might be out there, and I just missed it, though. But back to what we do know, Tsurumaki says he always struggled to envision music for his scenes, but that the Pillows had a rich back catalogue which made the prospect of deciding a little easier. He says by contrast, he's seen Anno write up almost a menu for the scores to his works, adding, I don't know if that's okay or not. Tsurumaki initially asked the Pillows for a song like One Life for the ending sequence, and they wound up coming back with two songs, one which was similar to One Life, and the much different ride on shooting star, which Sadamoto insisted was the right choice, and I agree. I'd imagine that if they had used the other track, they maybe would have been unwilling to use One Life itself, and the way that song gets used is fantastic. Although this does raise the question, what was the song they didn't pick? Given how huge the band's discography is, and their hefty portion of b-sides, I'd imagine it probably did see a release, so under that assumption, it might be Skeleton Liar or even Fool on the Planet, depending on when that was written. Although it's worth specifying, I don't think Fool being in the title is evidence either way, since the title is a pretty transparent reference to a Beatles song. Last note on the pillows, this comes from the Ultimate Edition DVD booklet again, frontman Yamanaka was the one who recorded all the sounds of Haruko's Rickenbacker. Okay, I don't know why, but this is one of my favorite anecdotes from this book. There's that scene in episode one where Mami Me says, More like a panda with a mean face. More like sandals with pressure points drawn on them. Or the smell of a blackboard eraser. That whole line was Sadamoto's doing, and this technique of using loosely connected ideas to articulate a feeling that's hard to pin down is something he quite likes, and also used in a manga he was working on before Fooly Cooly. I'm not 100% on this, but my hunch is that he's referring to this exchange from the one-shot Dirty Work, which was co-written by his wife. I'm just going to show it here, instead of having anyone voice it, it's a lot of text and the section is already too long. I'm sorry, it turns out brevity is not my strong suit. A sort of similar associative trick was used by Tsurumaki as the basis for episode 3. He took a handful of motifs he thought tied Nauta and Nina Mori together, spicy food, glasses, cats, and built the episode out of playing with those ideas. The mechanical design in that episode was done by Higuchi Shinji, although it was Sanamoto's idea to have a spider-like robot with a girl hanging down from its abdomen. Earlier, I mentioned the Ohira Shinya scene in episode 2, right? Imaishi was the animation director for that episode and was supposed to have some revisions done on it to match the scene better to the style of the rest of the episode, but in classic Gainax fashion, for scheduling reasons, Imaishi let it slide. Happy accident in my opinion, in part because it led to the gag where they had everyone's names on screen as a joke about how nobody looks like themselves, but really it's not like it was a goal for Fooly Cooly to be visually coherent cohesive or anything anyway. Tsurumaki repeatedly stresses how he wanted each animation director to be able to flex their signature styles. He cites how different Urusei Yatsura could look from cut to cut as an example. In fact, in one of the later manga sequences, he didn't even bother boarding it, he just gave it to Himaishi and said go crazy. Tsurumaki and Sadamoto carry this air of simultaneous fondness and almost reflexive embarrassment regarding how loose the show gets visually. Sadamoto jokes he can only tell who's who by the color of their hair and their voice most of the time because everyone draws the characters
characters so differently. And of course, just in case you were worried, like every conversation between Gainax animators, there's also a part of this book where they get distracted discussing which of their colleagues are tits men and which are ass men. In case, for some reason, you ever wondered why the baseball uniforms are so similar to that of the Kintetsu buffaloes, now the Oryx buffaloes, well, buddy, do I have an answer for you? It's because... Tsuramaki liked them. He also says that it was because the buffaloes had the image of being pretty lame at the time, people thought their uniform was ugly, mayhaps this is why they debuted everybody's favorite mascot girl in 2011. Who knows? Coincidentally, Nina Mori's design was inspired by model and actress Fukishi Kazue, who's the daughter of a Kintetsu Buffaloes player. Also about Nina Mori, perhaps the funniest to me piece of information to come from this book is that the scene where she eats dinner with Nasa's family was inspired by fucking Buffalo 66. Ah, oh, Jesus, Vincent Gallo's stranglehold on Japanese popular culture in the aughts never ceases to shake the foundations of my brain. All right, let's finish this section on Haruko. First of all, this comes from the commentary. So Kari Kano's voice cast was almost entirely made up of non-seiyu. It's one of the many aspects that makes the show feel so youthful and freewheeling. It's very cute. One of these new talents was Shin Tani Mayumi. She voiced Tsubasa, but like, you look at this character and you have a very particular image of what she sounds like in your mind. And then you hear her. She even caught me off guard, but after that initial shock, I just loved her performance for how different it is, but uh, so, okay, so for a project I've been working on for like a year and change on and off, I did a pretty huge deep dive on Kare Kano fan sites and BBSs, and no matter what people's general opinion of the show was as it was airing, they almost all made a point to complain about Tsubasa's voice. And like, keep in mind, this is a show whose utter collapse under its own scheduling issues has eclipsed the show itself, yet I don't like Tsubasa's voice came before isn't it weird how there was like literally no animation in this episode? But Tsuramaki rightfully believed in the strength of Shintani's performance nonetheless. I mean, I don't know, he probably never read any of these complaints, but according to him, even internally, they wondered if they could give a cute girl character like that such a voice. But at any rate, for this little project he was working on now, when trying to conceptualize a selfish older woman, to, his words, robot Hachan slash Robocon style crash at his protagonist's home, he struggled to differentiate her from Eva's Misato until his mind went back to Shintani's performance as Tsubasa, and in thinking about a character with that style of voice, gradually Haruko started to take shape. Tsurumaki cited Alice Bradley Sheldon's often venereal short stories about aliens as an influence on Haruko's alien abilities being rooted in innuendo. Hilariously, he said that as he was building out her history, the inclusion of Atomisk started to make the show come off too much like a standard boy likes girl, but girl already likes a different boy love triangle ordeal. So to get around this, Tsurumaki's solution was to make Atomisk a gigantic, unknowable bird creature, king shit. Where Haruko's design is concerned, though, Tsadamoto actually feels like making Haruko cool wound up superseding his ability to imbue her with much sex appeal, which was supposed to be more at the forefront of her look, given her character. Another happy accident, IMO, I think a big part of Haruko's appeal comes from the contrast in her appearance and behavior. Like, she's almost got a kind of quote-unquote masculine bravado about her that creates a fun gap. And on that note, going back to the Ultimate Edition DVD booklet again, Saramaki talks about what he jokingly calls a potential bully girl boom arising from works like Fooly Cooly. He contrasts this to the then recent maid boom. In a maid-master relationship, you may think the maid is the object in that the master is the one commanding the maid, but she's just as much the subject. 
It's precisely her service that acts as the primary leading mode of conversation between the two. In the same sense, and obviously we're speaking in the realm of fantasy or play with all this, it takes no action to be bullied, but it takes effort to bully someone. Yet in the same sense, there's something in the bullied that's provoking the bullying. So the subject and object aren't really so clear, and there's almost a sense that the other person feels strongly enough to bully you in the first place. He also says someone like Sheena Ringo is a prime example of the bully girl archetype in that she's got a strong and kind of aggressive energy about her. And like, look, some of you are probably thinking, what the fuck am I listening to right now? But think for a second, who is one of the current reigning god kings of manga right now? Who has defined the modern dami mommy paradigm and forced everyone to get really good at drawing sexy women in suits, if not a guy who admitted to having a core part of his personhood awakened by a girl antagonizing his bicycle, a guy who called his own manga evil fully coolly, motherfucking Fujimoto fucking Totsuki. I was barking like a fucking seal reading this shit, like actually cackling and shouting to my poor wife. Yes, he gets it. Tsuramaki fucking gets it. But that isn't the only aspect of my taste fully coolly shaped. God, what an awful segue. Okay, look. Growing up, I had always kind of felt like Fully Cooly was more influential to my taste in manga than my taste in anime. Or rather, it's what set me on the path to be more of a manga head than an anime head for a long time. Which is kind of funny considering I still haven't even read the damn manga, despite being a fan of Ueda's art. I don't know, I guess it's nice to know there's still new to me fully coolly left to be had, same with the novelization. And okay, what really made me more into manga is that my family was poor and you could get like seven books for the price of one complete series DVD set, but the emotional atmosphere fully coolly introduced me to, of aimless youths reconciling the smallness of their problems in the face of a vast and endlessly complicated world, is something I see much more in manga. Like, there's definitely Definitely a reason I, after reading it in freshman year of high school, considered Solanine my favorite manga, or hell, why, at around the same time, I considered Lost at Sea my favorite graphic novel. Which is so funny, like, I was 14. What here was I even able to connect to in these fucking mumble comey? But I've since spent time as an aimless 20-something reconciling the smallness of my problems in the face of a vast and endlessly complicated world, and thankfully have settled into being a decently grounded 20-something, not really worrying so much about how small my problems might be in the face of a vast and endlessly complicated world, and I have maintained a bottomless appetite for these kinds of stories, which has led me to really enjoy reading, or at least enjoy reading about in some cases, there's still so much untranslated manga in the world, a lot of of the manga that, surprise, had either an influence on or were internal touchstones for Fooly Cooly itself. We got the fucking review bra of Weekly Young Magazine himself, Mochizuki Minetaro. If any manga imprints are watching this, big or small, whichever, one of y'all should get your hands on the rights to Bataashi Kingyo. Thank you very much. There's also Adachi Tetsu, whose most relevant and, if I understand, most seminal work, Sakura no Uta, is virtually unknown in the English-speaking world. Tsuramaki and Sadamoto also mention Furuya Minoru, who I always confuse with Furuya Usamaru, whoops. Furuya Minoru's Boku to Isho's exaggerated Yankee-style characters give the impression of a very different story than the almost limitlessly grim pitch-black comedy it is. Like, this comic much more often resembles a Harmony Corinne film than it does Bebop High School or Crows. Rather than any one specific work, though, the part of Fooly Cooly that coalesced from these mangaka, and no doubt plenty others, is an unflinching approach to the dark parts in adolescence that eschews the romanticism that so often tints stories about youth. I want to take a brief detour from Fooly Cooly's youth manga connection, though, to talk about a mangaka that served as one of the strongest visual inspirations for Fooly Cooly. Can you tell I recorded this line in post? This is pretty well known at this point, both because her work has garnered more attention in the Anglosphere in the years since Fooly Cooly's release, and because it gets brought up by folks who worked on Fooly Cooly, like 
all the time, Sadamoto's primary influence on the look of Holy Coolie's characters was Anno Moyoko, yes, then future wife of Anno Hideaki, but far more importantly, an absolute legend in her own right. She's one of those authors who's kinda done it all, Jose, shoujo, seinen, diary comics, columns on beauty and fashion, a Ninagawa Mika movie adaptation, fucking original Xbox faceplate. She's 100% deserving of her own video someday. Her style is immediately recognizable and innately fashionable, so her influence felt like a strong way to lock into the contemporary feeling Fooly Cooley was taking on, and to very definitively distinguish the OVA's look from Evangelion. You can most clearly see it in the character's eyes, with their big, ovalescent shape compared to Sadamoto's usual, more narrow eyes, and the defined lower lashes. This will sound so perverted, but Mamimi's lips should have been a dead fucking giveaway for me all this time. But I guess when something is a part of your life for so long, it becomes difficult to see it as something made up of disparate parts, when it's not directly yelling to you, we're doing a South Park bit right now, or the joke is that Doraemon doesn't have ears. Honestly, Mamimi is kind of the cipher key and the most prominent grounding element to the show's youth manga roots, to circle back to that point. I think her scenes tend to carry that atmosphere most, especially the works of actual goat Okazaki Kyoko. Zero exaggeration, I think she's in the run-up for greatest living mangaka. If nothing else, she made my actual favorite comic of all time, Pink. Definitely something I'm not interested in making a video on, which is how you know it's legit. There's just a never-ending list of reasons I love it so much, and it's not even her masterpiece. Although, Helter Skelter isn't all too relevant to Fooly Cooly. I think the clearest touchstone here is River's Edge, which Vertical put out not too long ago as of me writing this video. My copy of River's Edge still hasn't arrived, so I admittedly haven't read it yet. Look, I like to savor the things I love. But it really just takes looking at this thing's compositions and locations especially. I mean, it's pretty self-evident. Bunch of kids wandering around smoking cigs at night, you get it. Okazaki's characters feel so simultaneously real and so otherworldly, easy to connect to but ever distant. And look, I know I went on that whole bully girl tangent earlier, and honestly for a long time if you'd asked, I'd probably say that Nina Mori was my favorite character for how she plays foil to Nauta, but on my most recent watch, man, it still struck me somewhere deep. Seeing Mamimi with those tired eyes in episode 6, or wringing her skirt out into the river, resonates with the part of me I don't really feel that pressed to examine, like, the emotion kind of speaks for itself. And funnily, Tsuramaki and Sadamoto seem to understand that as a fundamental aspect of her character. I didn't have much to say about Mamimi during the section on fully colic noise, and that's partly because I wanted to save talking about her till now, but also the duo repeatedly stressed that Mamimi is a kind of character you can't fully understand, that maybe they don't even fully understand, that thinking you understand her is when you're really done in. That's like my favorite quality in a character. It goes back to that evanescent quality I talked about at the start of this video. Early into production on this thing, I was chatting about the mangaka that influenced Fooly Cooly, and my dear friend Altfather said something that really stuck with me, and rather than paraphrase it, I'm just going to include it whole. What's insane to me is the way they were able to transmute those influences into something that works on the level of music. The entire series functions for the brain the way music does, when a chord strikes a melody. Imagery and sound married together tickle your brain like food or music does, rather than those mangaka whose works carry the language of film or literature. Music is at its best when it's doing something unreplicatable, when somewhere within the medium's preset components, something greater arises, as though new notes slip their way in between the offbeats and overtones, creating a far richer, if hazier, impression. Like catching a fleeting glimpse of something radiantly beautiful from the passenger seat of a car and blinking hard as though your eyelids were shutters. Listening to The Pillows was the first time music made me feel something based on the composition and performances alone. Alone. Sad lyrics made me sad, catchy songs made me want to listen to them on a loop, Weird Al was, well, funny, but this was unlike anything I'd experienced before. Needless to say, I didn't speak a word of the language, but I felt just how big music could be listening to Little Busters in full for the first time. 
even now, knowing how hard on sleeve their influences were, I still get that feeling where I don't so much the bands that came before them. Although for the record, Kurt Cobain was right, and all the very best Pixie songs are the ones that Kim sings. With any music that's worth a damn, this is true, but especially in a situation like the one I had as a young teen, that reaction quite literally transcends the work. The listener is bringing emotional weight into the equation, and an almost alchemical shift from subject to object occurs. I remember years ago, I was looking through a friend's copy of one of the Fooly Cooly art books, and this piece by Satomoto jumped out at me. It's very well known, it's the cover of one of the soundtracks, for God's sake. I've seen it hundreds of times, but I realized in that moment that this was the only time I'd ever seen official art of Mommy Me in something other than her school uniform, which is, as a refresher, the only thing you see her in through the entire anime, despite her not even attending school. It's rough. In that moment, it hit me. This must be a drawing of her post-series, after she's moved away. Prior to that, I'd always thought of her departure as something there for the sake of Naota's perspective, if that makes sense. Like, it's true to life. Sometimes people just abruptly depart from your life and you have to find your own closure. That's an almost requisite part of growing up. But when we think about Fooly Cooly as a young boy's coming-of-age story, we're ignoring how much all the surrounding female leads grow. And that's definitely not something you can say about many works in that genre. And in my heart, when Mommy Me has that light bulb moment to take a picture of Naota in the rubble, her arc is complete. Wherever she goes, whatever happens next, I have faith she'll be okay. But, you know, if I'd had a better eye during any of my previous watches before that fateful day in my friend's apartment, maybe I would have noticed that Mommy Me's photography makes first place in a magazine contest. That probably would have been a clear indication that she was finding success. Or who knows, I mean, I don't know how well magazine photography contests pay out, if at all. Maybe she hinged her bets on those photos and didn't get the return she wanted. Maybe she didn't strike out on her own and her whole family moved away, or one of her parents if you subscribe to the idea that they're divorced either way, and she's just wearing clothes that she already owned. But also her family is poor, she gets handouts of day-old bread from the Nandavas bakery, so maybe all her clothes at home are worn ragged. Meanwhile, that top looks pretty nice and new and clean, and look, do you see where I'm going with all this? There are an infinite number of ways to look at art, and just as many ways to make it. An earlier version of this script almost had a whole section about both Judy and Mary and fucking Mike and Melissa. At a certain point when you just enough art, enough writing about art, it all kind of falls apart and becomes noise, and you can either let that paralyze you or you can let it galvanize you. It's okay to not always think so damn hard all the time. Throw away those books you know you're never gonna read and put pen to paper. Grab an old camera you have lying around and point it at whatever next catches your eye. Play a stupid chord way too loud and break some strings. Life is short and fragile. Trust your instincts a little more and act while you can. When the time comes, pull as much air into your lungs as will fit. Step up to the plate, swing hard, and then run for your life.